Hey everybody, welcome, welcome. We're continuing our reading of the Tough Seer, highly educational. Time to nerd out, learn, learn. All right, so we're still in Surah Al-Baqarah, 80 through 82. Let's begin. And um, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Nirajim. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. And they say, the fire will only touch us for a few days. Say, have you received a covenant from Allah? For Allah will never break his covenant. Or are you saying about Allah things of which you have no real knowledge? Nay, those who do evil and are encompassed by their sin will be the inhabitants of the fire. They will abide therein forever. But those who believe and do righteous deeds will be the inhabitants of paradise. They will abide therein forever. Mm, beautiful. Allah mentions the abhorrent actions, then states that despite that they praise themselves and are certain that they will be saved from the punishment of Allah and will be granted His reward, and that the fire will only touch them for a few days, which are so few that they may be counted on the fingers. Hmm. So, I see. Somebody just trying to say, like, oh, you only get this or you only get that. Like, you don't know, so they shouldn't say, I, I getcha. Thus, they combined evil doing with the feeling that they would be safe from the consequences thereof. Hey, that's a good point. That's a good point, right? They're making it a sort of like, oh, well, the punishment won't be too long. Therefore, you... Okay, gotcha. Because this was no more than a mere claim, Allah, glory be to him, refuted them by saying, Say to them, O messenger, have you received a covenant from Allah, whereby you have pledged to believe in him and in his messengers and to obey him? This is the covenant that would lead to salvation a covenant that cannot be changed or altered? Or are you saying about Allah things of which you have no real knowledge? Here Allah, glory be to him, tells them the truth of their claim is connected to one of these two matters, and there is no third option. Either they have the covenant from Allah, in which case their claim is true, or they are saying something unfounded by Allah, in which case their claim is false. Okay, so... Asking them, okay, did you, did you get a, did you actually get some type of sign or a direct? Maybe, maybe it's a sign is maybe too weak, is what it's saying. Maybe you have to actually have a uh, revelation, essentially. I wonder what the criteria is. Do you, yeah, if somebody had to prove that, how would they prove it? But it's back in the past, right? Obviously, today you'd be like, no, doesn't count because it was said today, maybe. Back then, I wonder what they asked. This exposes them to greater disgrace and a more severe punishment. It is known from their situation that they have no covenant from Allah. Because they rejected many of the prophets to the extent that they killed a number of them because of their refusal to obey Allah and their breaking of covenants. There is only one possibility, which is that they are fabricators and liars who say about Allah what they do not know. And speaking of Allah without knowledge is one of the gravest and most abhorrent of forbidden actions. Okay, so you gotta have to, you have to know what you're talking about. You have to be well read, well versed. Not just willy nilly doing what you want. Then Allah, glory be to him, outlines a general ruling that is applicable to all, including the children of Israel and others. This is the ruling and there is no other. There is no room for their wishful thinking and their claims as to who will be doomed and who will be saved. Allah says, Nay, the matter is not as you say, for your claim is unfounded. Rather, those who do evil, this may include shirk, association of others with Allah. Ah, I remember Mufti Mink talking about shirk. This is shirk. Like, things is not permissible. You cannot partnership right and lesser sins yeah so partnership and then lesser sins 
association. But what is meant here is shirk based on the fact that Allah then says, and are encompassed by their sin. Encompass, man. Because you see, that's quite interesting because there's literal and psychological instances where you are encompassed by your sin, right? Like if you are an adult film actor, you're literally encompassed by your sin. Or there's this thing in California where people are, well, it's everywhere. I shouldn't just say California. However, it seems to be very popular here from my understanding of what I've witnessed. Uh, people are swingers. They'll swap each other's wives, right? Or in each other's husbands. Or they rent a, a private banquet hall and things go on over there. And they're literally surrounded by their debauchery and hedonism, right? When you go to the club, you're surrounded by your sin. You go to the bar, uh, a really rowdy bar, not just some small little cafe maybe in Paris. I'm not talking like something that are something in Italy or in England. Not those kind of cafe houses, right? Or those mini pubs, it's a little different. Although those are not permissible at all right but but there's instances where you're surrounded completely by your debauchery strip clubs right you're completely surrounded by your sin mentally and literally if you're a drug trafficker right you're committing the actions and you're surrounded by your sin everywhere in despair by actual where your physical location is the people with whom you work with and your morals, right? You're totally engrossed in it. It's very interesting. What is meant is that it encompasses the one who does it, leaving no way out. There's many instances where your sin can en engross you to where there is no way out, right? That's what happens when you see certain mafia bosses and uh, they say, Oh, right when I try to get out, they pull me right back in. It's like a famous line. So here it's very interesting seeing a sort of Islamic where he's like, there's no way out when you can be so encompassed by your sin. Even if you try to leave the bucket, you get pushed back in. Yes. Oh. This is only applicable in the case of shirk because the one who believes cannot be encompassed by his sin. Because if you're a believer, you will follow the rules and if you're following the rules you won't be led astray and if you're not astray you won't be in the actual physical or mental places for that to occur right uh -huh. will be the inhabitants of the fire they will abide therein forever now let's hold on let's go back to that though for a second if you're not encompassed by your sin because you're doing good things like I, I think like we can organize our lives to where we are doing things, good things with our time, productive things in our own unique ways. Instead of like going out and rioting or causing some type of harm, we can do a different route that is not going to count against us, right? The less innocent harm reduction method in a way. Very interesting. So that you don't cause a moment of shirk uh -huh. because you're doing evil because if you're doing evil it's unfounded you're transgressing it's a sin which means it's shirk but if you are looking in your own situation like is it better to stay inside and not commit shirk or is it better to go outside you know and and oh, okay yes all right let's leave it there we will be the inhabitants of the fire they will abide therein forever the Khajar writes, quote, this verse as evidence that anyone who commits sin becomes a disbeliever. But this is proof against them, as you may see, because it clearly refers to shirk. This is the case with every follower of falsehood who quotes a verse or sah sahi hadith to support his false notion. With every follower who quotes a verse, quote a verse, what do you mean? What he quotes as evidence will inevitably contain evidence against him. But, wait a minute, that's, uh, that's, wait, so, some, but, how do you know the action of quoting it, the follower of falsehood, 
using quotes can be both good and negative. So I guess it would depend on the context, right? Because they might use a quote to use to justify their sin. Is that what he's saying? Hmm. They'll do evil, but they'll cite the Quran and say, oh, or something. And then you'll be like, no, now you're taking it into it's not its meaning. Now you're actually committing shirk. You're not really uh, doing what you're supposed to. I don't think it means that you can't positively quote the Quran or uh, you positively use quotes as evidence for your case for a certain uh, ruling you think would work. Hmm. Huh. Using quotes as interpretation for actions or suggestions or agreements. Hmm. This is interesting. But those who believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers in the last day, and do righteous deeds, deeds cannot be righteous unless they meet two conditions. They should be done sincerely for the sake of Allah and in accordance with the sunnah of his messenger. Okay, so a righteous deed has to be agreements with the sunnah and it has to really just be sincere, sincerity. Can it be fake? 